Hey everybody, on today's episode of Still to be Determined, we're going to be talking about how to tell when an old idea might be the way forward. As usual, I'm Sean Farrell. I'm a writer. I write some sci-fi. I write some stuff for kids. And I'm just generally curious about tech and how it impacts our lives. And luckily for me, my brother Matt is that Matt of Undecided (laughs) with Matt Farrell. You, of course, know his channel. That's what brought you here. So how are you doing, Matt? I'm doing good. And you're a faceless Sean Farrell. (laughs) That's right. I'm going to tell a couple of stories today. There's going to be two stories. One is about how technology is remarkable and how it can really change our lives for the better. But that story goes like this. I'm currently working uh, on recording this podcast entirely from my phone. We are on a Zoom call and I'm recording my audio simply into my iPhone, which is sitting on a table and I am leaning over it. I'm talking working directly at the phone and it appears to be working so far. So if you're hearing <laughs> this or watching this on YouTube and you're seeing some sort of superimposed frozen image of me, you know, the technology is still pretty remarkable that I'm able to do all this via my phone. Now, let me tell you a story about how technology can fail us in remarkable and spectacular ways. I won't name who my internet service provider is spectrum, <laughs> but for the past three or four weeks, my internet has been spotty at best. And more recently, just this past weekend, it has spent more time down than it has up. It is remarkably frustrating. And so Matt and I have rescheduled this recording at least five times that I can recall (laughs) because I keep going back to him and saying like, they just extended the outage. We're still in an outage. Help. I don't know what to do. Help. So finally we settled on, well, what if we try to do a zoom call? So here we are. So my apologies to our listeners or viewers, if you are hearing any kind of degradation in my voice, it's not coming through very clearly. We appreciate your patience and putting up with it. And if you suddenly hear me cut out and I never return, it's because I've finally had enough and I've run (laughs) down the street to find the nearest spectrum office to slap some people silly. So. (laughs) Having said all of that, so before we get into today's discussion, which is going to be about Matt's most recent episode, which is about an old battery tech that may be the future of energy storage, that's his episode from December 13th, I wanted to share some feedback from viewers and listeners on our previous episode. This is a comment from our last episode, which was about the future of Matt's channel and effectively the future of this channel. And Matt and I were talking about ways that the channels might expand its scope. And there were comments like this from Michael Harvey, who shared his thoughts. I would love to see more on the medical front, AI and medicine. And then there was this from Dan Elpern, who wrote, keep up the good work. I've been interested in topics you've covered that were off my radar. Can't wait to discover more in 2023. And then there was this little nugget from make $750 per day. Failure is the condiment that gives success is flavor. Quote Truman Capote. Clearly that last one is spam. So, (laughs) but it's still nice, (laughs) but it's still nice to know. There was also this one from Bishop Knight who wrote, I would love to get some videos on biotech or AI advances like you are discussing today, even other tech sectors. I would especially love to see some videos about how these different tech advancements affect one another. Sometimes you touch on how new tech might play out or affect some other thing, but it's at the end and as a snippet that's part of the wrap up. I find these what about very fascinating, how one tech might be used with something totally different in a new way that no one planned would be revolutionary. I think that would be very interesting. So I think that all of that is terrific feedback. Thank you so much, everybody, for weighing in and for watching a video that was basically (laughs) just basically (laughs) it was just basically speculative. Yeah, and it's good for us to have that kind of conversation. I think with all of you listeners and viewers to get a sense of where you're hoping the channel might go. We would like to encourage you once again on this episode. Drop into the comments leave some comments about where you think uh, new tech advances and what kinds of technology you'd like to see more of, or even if it's just to say you you like the direction of the channel so far, let us know. Uh, We appreciate the comments. We appreciate the feedback. It's it's not an understatement to say that I, the direction of the channel is coming from a lot of you guys. So it's like, 
the viewer yeah. feedback is one of the things that drives the channel. So I love hearing feedback like that. It's great. Absolutely. That's, it's really remarkable. The, the, the kinds of not only comments that provide us with that kind of feedback, but the expertise in our listeners is always remarkable to see. And that's on display with this most recent episode, which is about zinc batteries, which I love the fact that this was patented back in the 1800s. This is, yes. am I right about that? Late, was it the it's, 20th century or the? It's 137 years old. <laughs> right. So I guess my big comment right out of the gate on that was in the vein of why did it take so long for this technology to find a place or had it been utilized in some other ways in the past that we just aren't paying attention to right now? No, it's been utilized, but there's like every technology, there's downsides to it. There's challenges to it. And like part of the reason that this is kind of getting traction now is there's new techniques that have helped to overcome some of those, those constraints that the, the technology has had before. So it's making it even better than it already was. Um, so like this is this is a, a battery technology that's like taught in <laughs> material science and engineering classes and universities all around the world. It's very well known, but it's 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 how these companies are trying to evolve it into something new and trying to make up for those downsides. That's kind of I think that's the main thing of the reason why now it feels like this might be the time where the zinc battery has a chance to kind of like stand up and kind of like get people to take notice. And based on your video, the, the various use scenarios are fairly straightforward, large scale, static, not, this is not us putting this into a phone. This is not even us trying to put it into a vehicle. Nope. This is us saying city scale or neighborhood scale, put this thing together and, and use it that way. I also really like the fact that it's a little bit, it sounded a little bit like an erector set or a Lego set, the way you described it as if you want more power, you put on more stacks. If you want more energy storage, you add more liquid. Yep. It really seems to fit various scales in that way from maybe even something as focused as like, I kept thinking about like a hospital having having one of these dedicated to a hospital you would need maybe long-term storage but not as much energy output so you might have the large liquid structure but a smaller level of stack and then for something that might be backup for short-term but large-scale energy use you'd have the opposite so it really yep. seems to be a you can manage this whichever direction you need to for your use as opposed to it being like one size trying to fit all. Yeah, it's it's not to muddy the waters here, waters here, but it's kind of like the hydrogen story too. It's like you have a fuel cell that's actually generating the electricity and then you have the storage tanks of the hydrogen itself. And it's the same thing here. It's like you have the storage tank of the zinc bromine solution and then you have the stack that's actually the one that's converting and creating the electricity. Uh, you can scale it any way you want. So you need more power, bigger stack, more storage, bigger tanks. So it allows you to really configure things where a typical battery doesn't work that way. It's more of a linear thing of you need more power, you add more batteries. You need more storage, you add more batteries. In either case, you're making a larger and larger pack. And so it doesn't scale as well as something like this, where you could scale one portion of it up for your whatever your needs are. And th that's the reason it's a perfect solution for something like stationary energy storage. Where do you think this fits in with all the various battery storage technologies that you talked about before in a, in a, I'm trying to make it as much apples to apples as possible on this, on the scale of this is ready to walk out the door right now and be one of the solutions that a company or a, a, a community, maybe even a city or a state might start using mm -hmm. to hold reserve power from solar plants or wind. If that's a 10 on the scale and a one is, this is just barely coming out of the lab, where do you think this technology stands? This is like a nine or a 10. This is like, in some cases, this stuff is already being used. Um, like uh, the zinc batteries from uh, Redflow in Australia, they've been making these for several years. These exist. 
they can, you can buy them today. So it's like this stuff is not 10 years down the road. This is in some cases it's available now. So it's, it's definitely a 10. You mentioned Australia. So that reminds me of this comment I wanted to share from Dave OCC who wrote, I think this one's decided here, Matt, as a half Aussie, I'm stoked to see this coming out of Oz. It makes me so happy. God, I hope they start pumping these out as fast as humanly possible. Even it's, even if it's an evolving product. Use them for fixed location storage exclusively, standardize the installation and access mechanisms, get it into place in practical sense, make sure the end client is aware it's a version 1.0 solution and will evolve slash improve. Here in the United Kingdom, we're running into grid problems, not just generation. And I have read that we may not be able to carry and deliver the power requirements for wider scale adoption of EVs mandated by the soon to change regulations. We really need distributed grid storage and rather badly. His comment is a bit longer than that. It goes on from there. I'm not going to read the entire thing, but it's very, very thoughtful. And it really puts into perspective how, and you know, you and I have talked about this before, Matt, not every community is dealing with the same issue. This mm-hmm. is, we constantly are hitting the bell of not the same tool for every job. You can also look at it in the opposite direction. Not every job is the same across the board. There are various communities like we've been seeing in your video, you talking about Australia's brush fires Mm -hmm. were a big mover in this kind of storage because it was having an impact on their energy generation and their ability to deliver energy safely and consistently in Australia. In the United Kingdom, it's a different problem. It's yep, completely, it's a very different problem. And the energy needs in the UK, not only does our comments are point out the electric vehicle issue is going to create a bigger draw on the grid, the United Kingdom, I've seen now over a period of three or four years now through something as simple as YouTube, I'm seeing people in the United Kingdom complaining about how hot it is during the summer. Their mm-hmm. summers and climate change are reaching temperatures that they are not accustomed to. They're going to start seeing more air conditioner usage. They haven't historically had to rely on that during the summer. That is going to have an impact. So something as simple as it's getting hotter and you want to run a fan or you want to run an AC, is going to impact the grid in monumental ways. Yep. And massive storage needs on that front are going to be needed. Yeah, it's it's you, every region has a different need. Like in Canada, they're pretty much 100% hydropower. So it's like, that's not the case for the Southwest US. It's like, it's, there's, depends on where you are, what your energy generation sources are, what your needs are, it's going to determine what kind of energy storage technology makes the most sense for you in that area. And I'm a big fan of microgrids. Uh, The more microgrids, the better. So you're talking about like hotels that can self-sustain themselves homes, apartment buildings, the more that you can take that reliance off the grid for something like the UK, that could be a really good solution for them because it's like the more that you can reduce that, you need a giant power plant to supply an entire region and you can start to break that up. It starts to remove that concern about not being able to supply enough electricity and the grid not being able to handle the amount of electricity something like an EV is going to take. So it's there are ways to solve the problem. It's not that it's an easy engineering problem. It's but it's solvable. It's just, you have to look at the entire, everything that's available to you. And on that note, this kind of semi off topic, but again, going back to hydrogen, which is often sold as our hydrogen future is going to solve all of our problems and we can have transportation and we can do all this stuff. Some of the stuff that's like for the UK specifically that's on the table right now is, uh, switching over their boilers to hydrogen for in the UK for heat and right. If you look into it, that makes no sense. Stop doing that. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I am not a fanboy of hydrogen, but there are aspects of hydrogen I think are really promising and exciting to keep a, to keep tabs on, but it's not a one size fits all solution. And I, yeah. it, I think it's a stupid idea to go hydrogen for heating homes, but it's good for other things potentially. And so for this is the same thing, this zinc batteries and these, these flow batteries are going to make a really good big dent because they're available today. They can be used today and start to be scaled up and make a huge difference in how we store electricity. It, but it depends on your use case. 
I also wanted to visit this topic on this battery uh, technology. The factories that would be required to create them, it's really an interesting aspect that it would be so much cheaper to just convert existing mm-hmm. battery factories over to create this type of battery. This comment from Lalwat, who wrote, Gellion, or is it Jellion? It's gel ion. Gel ion. Gellion. He writes, Gellion designing the one battery that it uses the vast majority of existing lead acid battery manufacturing steps was a stroke of genius. Far, Mm -hmm. far too many potentially revolutionary battery technologies never make it out of a lab because they fail to make the jump to mass production. But I bet this one doesn't meet the same fate. The high functional temperature range and non-flammability are great too. It means I could theoretically theoretically put one in my uninsulated garage and not care that the garage becomes an oven in the summer and a freezer in the winter. The thing would really still work safely regardless. It's it, safety and ease of manufacturing seems like two gigantic pluses on this technology. Yeah. It's it's the, the reusing infrastructure wherever you can reduces that the, not just the cost, but the difficulty in scaling it out and getting it out there. So it's like, yeah. it's, it's a, it's a win, win. It's, it's part of the reason I was saying hydrogen for heating homes is a stupid idea. The infrastructure doesn't exist to get the hydrogen into people's homes. And you can't just reuse existing pipelines because the pipelines aren't capable of handling hydrogen because it's a s- small atom that will escape and leak and corrode pipes. It's like, you can't just flip over, which means you're having to redo all of your infrastructure. It's a huge cost, a huge burden. There are solutions like this where it's like, oh, let's reuse this lead acid battery factory and we don't have to build a whole new factory and we can scale it up quickly and it's safe. And so it's like there's all these pros to doing it the way that they're doing it, which is very clever. It's a, it's it shows clever engineering and there's a, a real like kind of nice ingenuity to how they've approached this problem. It's, it's obvious from all the details that you shared. And it was a very uh, all encompassing video. I wanted to get your thoughts briefly on this and i don't know that you actually know this information in talking about repurposing factories and in talking about which countries are wealthy in the technology and the 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 types of materials that go into various batteries if this was to scale up and become a competitor in various markets with lithium what countries are most directly impacted by that kind of competition? I know as a source of lithium, China would be impacted, but mm-hmm. is China also a major producer of the batteries themselves? Or are there other countries that are also doing battery production that would be impacted by a new competitor? Or are there countries that would benefit from this being a new player in the market? I don't have all the facts, but here are some of the facts. China is a massive player in lithium and, and vanadium. So China's making uh, vanadium redox flow batteries, which is a similar technology, just a different chemistry. They're one of the major suppliers of vanadium, and they're also the biggest supplier for lithium and all that kind of stuff. So it's they have the most to lose at competing technologies like this. And there's a reason Australia is leaning heavily into zinc because they are one of the larger zinc suppliers of the world. <laughs> so there's a reason why they're leaning into that. So they have a lot to gain by going down this path because it's a supply chain that they already have a really good handle on and can really expand. So it, it's, this is something we're going to see more and more of, of countries leaning into technologies because they have a supply chain that they can lean into for it. The United States is, tr- we're trying to build that up for ourselves, but you're going to start to see this happen around the world. Like Brazil is going to be doing one thing where Australia is going to be doing a different thing. And the EU is going to be doing something completely separate because it's, they're going to be leaning to what supplies they have easy access to locally, most likely. Yeah. All of it is very interesting as we see in, again, the title of your video gets right to the point. <laughs> this isn't even new tech. This is just the revisiting of an existing uh, knowledge base. And it's really impressive that you have two companies bringing this to market at a time when it's never been more clear that this kind of storage need is necessary and growing 
And so I'm really, really interested in, in revisiting this. And I'm especially interested in revisiting this from the perspective of several of your commenters who said, at this point on your channel, you have visited so many battery technologies. Yes. It would be worth doing a revisit of some of these battery technologies and especially revisiting them in comparison to one another. Maybe like a one video roundup of where are all these techs right now and how do they stack up against one another? It's because you and I talk about these things and I'll be yes. honest, there are times where we're in the middle of a conversation and I'm thinking, did we talk about this six months ago? I don't remember, but it yeah, would be worth revisiting. I'm glad you brought that up because it, that that comment, that thread of comments, I've I saw pop up. We took note talking about how like the commenters really helped to kind of steer the ship for the channel. It's on our roadmap. I just had a meeting call with my team this morning. We were discussing this exact thing, and we already had on our our roadmap for early next year a video about kind of like the the roadmap of like what's happening with battery technology in 2023, like what's out there, and so it's kind of evolving into something just like this. Like we are planning to take a look at all these different things we've talked about over the past year and kind of like putting them in all in one place and discussing and comparing them to each other. And we're, we're planning on doing just that. So stay tuned. Yeah. Stay tuned indeed. Yeah. So as Matt and I have just said, your comments really do help drive the show. So thank you so much for those. Please drop into the comments right now. Leave a thought about this episode or revisit the comments that were talked about in this episode. Talk about the battery tech itself. We'd appreciate your feedback. If you'd like to support the show, don't forget you can go review us on Apple, Google, Spotify, wherever it was you found this, including YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe while, you, while you're there. And on YouTube, if you're seeing this and you're seeing my not smiling face, <laughs> please know that I appreciate your feedback. I appreciate your likes. And we encourage you to tell your friends, share us. And uh, if you'd like to more directly support us, you can go to the join button right here on YouTube where you can go to stilltbd.fm, click on the Become a Supporter button, and that allows you to throw some coins at our heads. Right now, I'm not a moving target, so I'm easy to hit. So I appreciate the, the attempts. Both of those options let you support us directly, and that support makes this show possible. Thank you so much for listening or watching. We'll talk to you next time.